common to say these days, uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. And welcome to another of Corporation Africa's awareness raising webinars about cooperatives. Today, we're going to focus on credit unions, as they're called in Europe or America, or savings and credit cooperative societies, or SACOs, as they're called in much of Africa. Our first speaker will be Sally Ann Decker, who is an associate professor at the University of Greenwich Business School. And she will look at what credit unions are and how they work. She's a specialist in credit unions and has researched them extensively. And she's not only a member of a credit union, but she's also a board member of a credit union in the UK called the London Mutual Credit Union. After that, <clears throat> we will turn to uh, Ethiopia and we will ask Wunden again, who will speak, give an overview of SACOs in Ethiopia. He has worked in them for more than a decade and is currently, um, he works as a rural finance advisor in Ethiopia for an international NGO that provides services on personal financing. But he will also be speaking as a member of a SACO and we'll talk about his experiences in that context. After that, Ralph Henry will look at how credit unions operate in the Caribbean. Ralph Henry has been a lecturer in economics at the University of the West Indies, and more recently, a consultant to governments and international organizations. He is, in fact, the chairperson of Kiri Consultants and a founder of the Pan African Enterprise Research Council. He too has personal experience of credit unions and will be telling us about successes and challenges that he has uh, experienced directly in the Caribbean context. Finally, uh, during the discussions, uh, James Mbui will contribute his experience of credit unions. Uh, he's the CEO of Amica Savings and Credit, which is based in Kenya. And he will tell us about what makes Kenya's credit unions are different from many others around the world. From Corporation Africa's objectives, our concern is how our associates and members can join or form credit unions, and also how we can mobilize the power of credit unions to help finance cooperatives, especially worker-owned cooperatives that we seek to help to form across the continent. Let me just say, please don't forget to use the comments and questions uh, uh, facilities which are available, as you know, on Zoom. But now I just want to say a little bit about Corporation Africa and encourage you who have not yet joined to join. As you will know, those of you who have uh, attended previous sessions, Corporation Africa is a civil society organized initiative committed to encouraging and supporting the development of cooperatives in Africa and the diaspora. We want to do this because we think that cooperatives um, have many advantages over other forms of business organization. They are inclusive, they're egalitarian, they're democratic, they provide secure employment, and they produce what people consume and rely on, but also develop indigenous knowledge, local knowledge. We are now in the first phase of our development of that is of the organization, and that is to build up a membership base. When we have enough members in any one place, we intend that they should set up a financial institution to support cooperatives. So by joining us, you help us to bring us closer to the stage when members in a particular country will be able to start building the financial institutions in that country that will support cooperatives. So please help us move towards that, achieving that goal so that we can move on to the next level of our organizing. And so with that, I call on Sally Ann to Adeka to make her presentation. Sally, please make your presentation. Thank you very much, Adote, for, for the introduction. And I must say, I'm really delighted to be here. So I'm um, in the same vein that you have started. I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who's joined. This um this call today, and um I've been I have been working on credit unions for some time. I find them very interesting, 
they are really an important component of the financial services sector in any country. And they do a lot of um, provision for people who are low and medium income earners. So with that, I'll just start with my presentation. I'll just share my screen and just talk for about 20 minutes, I think I have. So I've been asked to talk about what credit unions are and what they do. And the structure of my presentation is going to be this. I'll have a, a brief introduction, say what credit unions are, and I'll try to highlight what their defining characteristics are, what make them different from other types of cooperatives, and what make them different from banks, which are their main competitors. Just talk a little bit about the origins, and that is just to get us to think about why they exist at all. Why should they exist? And then just a little bit about the principles which guide their operations and regulation, and then I will conclude. So just a few data, the credit union movement is a global movement, it exists worldwide. Credit unions operate in six continents. There are 87,914 credit unions. This is from the data from the Trade Association, the of the credit unions, the Global Trade Association. They have um, you know, 393 million members and they're operating 118 countries. So that is a significant um, st standing for credit unions. They also have a 12.69 penetration globally, which means that for the adult populations, but that just masks the differences which are between different countries, because for some countries, the penetration is as high as 113%, for example, in Ireland, and in some countries, the, con the concentration is really, the penetration is really about 1%. So there is great variation, but it's just interesting to see that it's a real global movement and a phenomenon. One thing I'd like to say here is that we talk about the credit union movement movement and we don't talk about the credit union industry and there's a reason for that because movements come to uh, groups of people who come together to achieve a particular social goal and so the credit unions therefore they are known as a credit as a social responsibility movement, the credit union movement is a social responsibility movement because people are working to challenge conditions which affect people generally. Anyway, so my next slide is more data. We can see here, this just shows who credit unions serve. And in the top bar, it shows that worldwide, the split between men and women is kind of 50-50. So it's 51% men and 47% women. That's the split of whom they serve. But it differs from, from continent to continent. In Europe, it's 58% men, for example, but in Africa, it's 44% men. So in Africa, they serve more, 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 women, more women than men. And in terms of the age of people who they serve, we see that worldwide, credit unions serve an older, older sector of the of of of, of, of the population. So, seventy one percent, for example, worldwide would be people between forty five and sixty four. Okay, now the, in, and in Africa, it's 67% of people who are 45 and 64, but the Caribbean box the trend, and I'm sure we maybe we'll hear about that because 25% are older people, but 75% are younger people being between, between the ages of 31 and 44 in the Caribbean. So what is a credit union? So here, I'm just going to use the definition which is provided by the World Council of Credit Unions, which is the trade body for credit unions. And it defines credit unions as customer and member-owned financial cooperatives, which are democratically controlled by their members and operated for the purpose of maximizing the economic benefit of the members by providing financial services at competitive and fair rates. So that's the official definition by the trade body. And with this definition, there are certain there are a number of things which we can note and I'll just to, to break it down. We can see here, first of all, they are a type of cooperative. So we know that cooperatives have special characteristics which they're owned by their members. But 
Unlike other cooperatives, they specialize in retail and consumer banking. So that's providing financial services to individuals and small businesses. That's what's retail and consumer banking about. So they're very relationship banking oriented. Then also this overlap which exists between the members and the owners is quite interesting because the members are owners and customers. So the, the members can actually have different roles and positions within the credit union as an owner, as a, a member, and as a customer. And it's really important, we will see later for issues relating to how credit unions are governed because you know member owners, they vote and to help with the decision making in the credit unions. <clears throat> credit unions have been defined as the purest form of cooperative. And what that means is they serve only their members. So exclusively, they serve their members. And this is an interesting distinction because you have cooperative banks, which are also cooperatives, but they're not pure cooperatives because they do serve people who are not their members. Some of their customers are not their members. So having highlighted those those points. I mean, I made the point earlier that credit unions are social responsibility movement, but that was not in the definition which WACU provided. We'll just look at some of the other things which make credit unions stand out from banks. Credit unions have dual economic and social goals. So they're not just there to maximize profits, which is what banks do. Banks and institutions in the private sector, they're profit maximizers. So they have economic goals, and that's to make profit for external shareholders. Credit unions are different. They have to make, they make a profit, they have to have a surplus, but they also have social goals. So we say that credit unions are not for profit institutions. And I just had to add there, but they are not charities. Because sometimes people think that because a credit union has social goals, it's, it's you know, it does not have to think about profit, but they do. They cannot meet their social goals if they're not financially sustainable. So it's really important to note that they have to balance these two goals. And then credit unions have a concern for community and social responsibility because they tend to be local localized institutions. So where they're based and where they operate, they actually inf influence that area and they have an impact on that community. They can play a significant role in community development and in the social issues which affect that area. When it comes to how they actually serve their members, we can we see that the main products which credit unions offer are savings and loan products all over the world. That's the basic. But they can offer other things such as current accounts. In some credit unions offer insurance products as well. For example, credit unions in the United States and Canada, they offer almost everything which banks also offer. So they, they, they offer a very wide range of services. In some other parts of the world, credit unions have a narrow range of things which they offer and they might not be able to meet all types of banking needs. So having identified the ways in which they're different from banks, we can now think of something else which is unique to credit unions. And that is something which is referred to as the credit union common bond. Okay. So credit unions have something which is called a common bond, which makes them different from all other cooperatives as well. What is this common bond? Now this common bond is a characteristic which the members would share. And this common bond is a requirement which will qualify somebody to join a credit union. So for somebody to be able to join a particular credit union, it has to tick a box and that box will allow it to, to, to become a member. It has to have a particular characteristic. Now there are different types of common bonds and there are four main types, four main types geographical, workplace, associational, and whether you follow a particular occupation. And I'll explain these briefly. So with a geographical common bond, the requirement is that you have to live, work, or study in a particular area. So that is why it's called geographical. So those types of credit unions which take people who live, work, or study in a particular area are referred to as community common, community credit unions. 
The other type of credit union is, the second one is a workplace credit union. And for that, this is for people who work for the same employer. So you have a workplace credit union. And um, then you also have an associational credit union. With associational credit unions, this would cover people who are members of a particular association or a particular organization. And here you can think of churches. If all people are, for example, all members of Holy Trinity Church or some church could have a credit union in their name. And then the other one is people who follow a particular occupation. So for example, people who are soldiers or armed forces, for example, you could have an armed forces credit union. The largest credit union in the world is the US Navy credit union, for example. So these are the types of common bonds. So having to meet that requirement is really important for credit unions. It's important to bear that in mind. And these common bonds could be def defined very narrowly. So a credit union will be quite small if the common bond is very narrow, or they could be defined quite broadly and less rest restrictively, which would allow a credit union to become bigger and grow. So I, at the beginning, I asked an interesting so why should we have credit unions at all? Why should they exist? We have banks, why should we have credit unions? And to understand that, we just have to look a little bit at the history of credit unions. They started in the 1800s in Germany during the Industrial Revolution. And at that time, two types of credit cooperatives emerged. One group, um, one groups emerged in rural areas where we had farmers, and the other group emerged in urban areas where you had people who are tradespeople and artisans. And the names of the people who promoted these credit unions um, uh, were Raiffeisen and Schulz Delisch, and so we know credit unions after those names. Now, the modern credit unions, which we have an adaptation of the Raiffeisen style credit unions, which had volunteer members, the, the members volunteer to run the credit unions, the common bonds were more restrictive, they were quite tight, but they were, they were able to lend in more generous ways, which allowed people to be able to, to join. So I've said here that these credit unions, I've called them a problem solving social innovations, because there are certain reasons why they had to emerge. And there were two problems which were affecting people in Germany at that time. The first problem was a problem which we called information asymmetry. Now, information asymmetry sometimes is common in all types of financial transactions when you have one party knowing more than the other party. Usually the person who wants to borrow knows more about themselves than the person who wants to lend. And the person who wants to lend has to take a risk to do the lending. So there's a problem there. And what happened in Germany was that people were not able to borrow because they had certain characteristics which made it difficult for the lenders to assess them. They didn't have money, some people were poor, they didn't have collateral, so they did not lend to them. The other thing which was a problem was financial inequality. Since people did not have enough money, then therefore they could not provide collateral. So these information problems, not knowing enough about the people and the people not having the collateral made it difficult for banks to lend to them. They did not want to lend to them. So the way in which this problem was solved was through the common bond. People who had a social connection, a pre-existing social connection came together and then formed these credit unions. They would save together and lend to each other. And it worked really well because they became successful. They could uh, monitor each other. They could see what their savings profiles of, of their members were. It would reduce their bad debts. They were able to influence each other. And so these credit unions became established by people cooperating in their local communities to solve their own problems. And as a result, credit unions had a, a lot of benefits. You know, there were three main things which we could think about. One is financial include, inclusion. People who were out of the system were now able to access financial services. And that is a good thing. The more people who use the financial system and participate in economic life, the more an, an economy is likely to develop. The other benefit which people achieve from credit unions is it develop their financial resilience. So as people accumulate savings, 
if there's a shock in their life, an unexpected event, it does not really make them as vulnerable as they would be if they didn't have savings. So more financial resilience because they had savings, they could borrow at reasonable rates. And that extra money which they have, they were now able to invest. And that investment now contributes to economic growth. So there are main, three main benefits of this innovation, which came about to solve these information problems and the problems of inequality which existed. Having spoken about those, the way in which credit unions came about and what problems they solve, I just want to turn my attention now to think about how credit unions bring in cooperative values in what they do, how they operationalize their provision of financial services and bringing on board these operating values. As I said earlier, they're part of a movement and they have an international set of operating principles which all credit unions subscribe to. There are 10 principles in all which have been provided by the World Council. And these principles are in three categories. The first category has to do with cooperative structure. The second category has to do with how they provide service to their members. And the third category has to do with social responsibility. So what I can say about the first category is the three principles are that they are member owned, member controlled, and they operate with a democratic mandate. Now we talk a lot about the democracy of credit unions because one member has one vote. One member has one vote. It doesn't matter how much you save in the credit union, you have only one vote in the matters of the, of the credit union. And this we consider to be a good thing because people, the members can exercise their voice and their power through their voting rights. Well, this is a very good thing and it can be effective as a way of governing the credit unions. But what we find is that as credit unions get bigger and bigger and the composition or the makeup of the credit unions changes, then the, the voting power of people can become diluted. And people might just stop voting as the credit union gets bigger, they become disengaged from the way in which the credit union might be run. The other thing is you could have conflicts between credit unions which are which are dominated by borrowers and credit and between borrowers and savers in those credit unions because sometimes you can have credit unions dominated by borrowers some are dominated by savers so we have to manage those conflicts which might exist within the credit union as well well as part of the democratic process the second thing which we have as part of the operating principles is service to members. Again, this covers three principles. These are financial inclusion, financial sustainability, and how credit unions maximize the economic benefits which they bring to their members. As I said earlier, financial inclusion should not be at the expense of the financial stability of the credit union. Members get benefits because they're paid dividends out of the surplus, the economic surplus, which a credit union makes, they would receive dividends. And also, when the credit union makes a surplus, it uses that to improve the services which it provides to its members. So in that way, they get an economic benefit through the interest rates which they might charge, the range of which they might get, the range of services, and also through the dividends. The final point is social responsibility. And what social responsibility covers is the way in which credit unions address the problems in society. So problems like exclusion, problems like people being treated unfairly, for example, in, finance, in, in, the, when the, in the way they use financial services. Here, social responsibility involves financial education. So for example, what we're doing now, educating people about the way in which financial, in, uh, way in which credit unions work. It also involves the cooperation between members of the cooperative movement and between credit unions themselves because credit unions work together to support each other. It also covers the community responsibility but credit unions have to invest into the community. So these are the three main areas which the principles cover. 
And here is an example in action where you see a collaboration of social response between credit unions. The Irish League of Credit Unions is actually supporting the rejuvenation of the credit union sector in Sierra Leone, where the credit union sector was devastated completely by, by the war which took place there. And we can see how the Irish League of Credit Unions has gone in to support with training and other kinds of capacity building initiatives. And now from six credit unions, there are now over 25 credit unions in Sierra Leone as a result of this collaboration with credit unions helping other credit unions from different parts of the world. Of course, I mean, I just think that we, because credit unions are financial institutions, you cannot talk about them and not talk about the fact that they are regulated institutions. So apart from the internal governance which they have as through the democratic processes which they apply, they also have external governance and that comes from regulation. And there are three main areas which I want to just highlight. The first has to do with the entry requirements. They have to be registered and authorized. And in different countries, this is done in diff organized in different ways. In the UK, for example, the same organization that registers and authorizes banks is the same organization that registers and authorizes credit unions. In different parts of the world, it's different. But what credit what is important is that the entry requirements are not so low that unviable institutions can come in and weaken the, the sector. The second type of regulation has to be the financial soundness of credit unions. We have prudential regulation, and that is to make sure that credit unions, for example, have enough capital to absorb losses if they have enough problems, they have the right amount of liquidity. For example, that's also an important aspect that the loan quality, the asset quality is good. And within the credit union movement, they have their own system which they use to actually identify areas for looking for financial soundness. It's called the PALS Financial Management and Monitoring System. PALS, the P is looking for, you know, protection of the assets of the credit union. It has indicators for E, which is for effective financial structure to make sure that it has capital, whether the assets of good quality, that's the A, the interest rates which are charged and whether that's enough to cover the costs of lending, liquidity, to make sure that there is adequate cash flow and then signs of growth, whether the credit union is improving. So that's the prudential side of the regulation. And also, we also have to think about when regulation, when credit unions might be in financial distress. We have, in some countries, there is a deposit insurance scheme which covers credit unions. In the UK, the same scheme which covers banks covers credit unions. So deposits up to 85,000 pounds are covered. But not all countries in the world have this kind of coverage for, for credit unions. And it's really something which is important because it really uh, contributes greatly to the reputation of the sector. So the sector to, to work well needs an enabling environment where you have strong regulatory system, which is strong, but not burdensome. Strong and simple, but also one that can support credit unions to be able to serve all the people that they can inclusively. So I'll just go now to my main conclusions, some of the key points which I brought up. That unique feature of credit unions is that their membership is defined and restricted by the common bond. That's a distinctive characteristic. So although they're cooperatives, it's something to remember the common bond. Okay. They're also different from banks because of the fact that they have both economic and social goals. And the members are part of a global credit union movement. It's a movement and not an industry. So that's something which is really important to remember about a distinction of the credit unions. And they have inclusive banking potential. And the reason I've called it potential is that we know that yes, they do not discriminate. They will lend to anybody who qualifies with, under their common bond, but they really have to have the right environment to be able to, to take advantage of that potential which they have. 
Credit unions are a viable form of economic organization. We've seen the data, the statistics that there are a lot of credit unions and credit cooperatives in the world. So people are using them and are very much in, in many parts of the world. And the reasons why they emerged still prevail. There is still financial inequality, and also we still have information problems in lending to them. So the benefits which they bring of inclusion, resilience, and growth are things which we could all continue to achieve as the, system, as the credit union sector improves in different parts of the world. So thank you very much. That's my presentation done. I hope I've um, managed to keep in time or maybe went over a little bit. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sally Ann. Just a little bit over. Um, and so, uh, but thanks for that. I think we have a basic understanding of what credit unions are about and why they exist and how they operate. So I would like please to um, invite Walt again to, um, to give us uh, his take on the application of some of those ideas and principles in the Ethiopian context. Please go ahead, Bond again. Thank you, everyone, for uh, the for the chance you are giving me to present uh, my experience regarding to the SACOS development in Ethiopia. My name is uh, Wendu Magen. I am working in uh, Niras Consulting Company as financial uh, advisor for agrobig uh, agribusiness induced growth program in Ethiopia. The previous speakers, uh, it is just like uh, my uh, background because it helps me to minimize my presentation also. So thank you for the pre previous presenter also. As the previous speaker says that for the cooperative development, uh, there are uh, different types of uh, registration and authorization uh, in different countries. So in Ethiopia, uh, for the reg registration and authorization, not only registration and authorization or regulation, there is also some other uh, other uh, tasks who are responsible uh, or acting uh, for the, not only the SACOS, but also other cooperative developments. This government setup is starts from the federal level up to the village level for the development of not only SACOS but also other types of cooperatives. As you, if you see my slides from my slides, there are a federal cooperative promotion commission at the federal level and uh, there are also regional uh, cooperative authorities then uh, there are other, other uh, uh, zonal cooperative uh, promotion offices, downstream district cooperative promotions and village uh, uh, extension service providers. With this, um, as the previous speakers uh, said, uh, much of the regulation and its provision, the capacity building, and organization and registration, even liquidation is done by this uh, government body. And uh, this is uh, what we have in uh, our country. When we see the uh, corporate development in Ethiopia, you know, as a background, we are following four types of uh, organizational types. This organizational types differ from country to country. If you see the uh, organizational tire of the Indians, it has a five tires level. And if you see some other countries, it may be two types or one type. In our country, as per the, our uh, cooperative proclamation, it has a four type, uh, tires. And the first tire is the primary cooperatives who are uh, established by individual members. And in this uh, primary cooperatives, there are more than 37 types of cooperatives existed in Ethiopia. Those are majorities are agricultural cooperatives, while the others are uh, non-agricultural cooperatives like SACOS, that is the financial cooperatives, and the artisans, the electricians, the road types of cooperatives are uh, here in Ethiopia. 
And the second type is the cooperative union. Uh, there are 12 types of cooperatives established by the 355. Uh, there are uh, uh, 12 types of uh, unions. That means the second type of the uh, cooperative. Uh, and in this cooperative, there are 365 uh, in number. With this uh, cooperative unions, uh, more than 18,000 primary cooperatives are a member of this second tier of uh, cooperative development. The third type is the cooperatives federation. Uh, currently, we have only two uh, types. That is the multipurpose cooperatives who are engaged, which are engaged in agricultural marketing uh, and also for saving circles federations. The uh, last apex uh, cooperative type is uh, the co cooperative leagues, which is not yet established, but it is it may be uh, hope will be established in the near future. Other types of the uh, tire is already uh, established. When you come to the uh, saving and trade cooperatives in Ethiopia, they reach a three types of levels of uh, organizations and the primary circles are uh, old age, especially the uh, urban circles are old age than other types of cooperatives. They established in 1990s by the foreign uh, scholars who are working together with other uh, companies working in Ethiopia, like Ethiopian Airlines, Ethiopian uh, Road Authority, and other types of uh, uh, business ventures. Uh, while the majority of the SACOs, who are, uh, actually their numbers is 21, so more than 21,000 primary selling and trade cooperatives, uh, majorities are established uh, within these two decades, uh, while uh, few are established since 1990s. And as the previous speaker says that, based on the uh, common bondage, there are some uh, SACOs who are established as a national uh, wide or geographic, and the others are in, in their occupations, uh, like civil servants in a, uh, some governmental organizations, and some are organized in a village level who are uh, living in one village or in one district. The second tier is uh, currently we have uh, more than 125,000 credit saving and credit cooperatives. Uh, this uh, cooperative type for the second tier of the SACOs are uh, organized within two decades. That means they are very infant and few in numbers. Uh, the establishment is based on the regional states. For instance, in the Tigray and the Zahamara region, the other types of cooperatives like radiation, whatever the be it in urban or be it, uh, rural, they can be a member of the uh, uh, selling and credit, credit union. That means their common bondage is the finance. Finance. So that for that, for that, for to resolve their financial problem, every type of cooperatives gather and form this type of cooperatives. While in the other regions like the southern part, the Oromia and the uh, eastern part of the country, established only by the SACOS. Uh, so we have uh, uh, following different approaches of organizing these cooperative saving and credit unions. The, the federations, when you come to the federations, actually they are very infant and two in numbers. Uh, they established in Amhara region in Addis Ababa, and they are not uh, well organized because they are very infant and uh, to do some business, they are uh, not yet started. Uh, when you see the, their service provisions, uh, the primary cooperatives are that that is primary saving and cooperatives are well, they have wide arrays of micro and small financial services like savings, loans, uh, insurances like uh, uh, credit life insurance and also crop insurances they have provided, including uh, non financial services like financial literacy and uh, business development services in some part of uh, circles. 
while the uh, second tier, like the uh, credit and saving uh, uh, unions, they uh, largely uh, involved in the large financial services like uh, loans, uh, insurances, and uh, savings. And also, they uh, provide in financial services like capacity strengthening for their downstream primary, primary cooperatives, be it SAPO or other types of cooperatives. The federations expected to do like uh, as a central financing and also capacity development activities. This is their uh, organizational uh, activity that is they need to be provided these services. Uh, when we see the, uh, some of the benefits of the members, actually the previous speakers told much more, but a few, uh, what I want to say is that uh, these selling credits are much benefits for the, be it the, the large communities, be it the poor and the poorest of the people, be it the women or the uh, four disadvantaged groups that highly participated and benefiting this uh, population. Some of their contribution is they are contributing for the improvement of livelihoods that is for in consumption aspects, in production aspects, asset building, education and health. Uh, so they, some of the uh, members also benefited. They created their business venture and generated incomes also. Most of the members, especially in the civil servants, they resolve housing problems. This is a very key, especially in Addis Ababa, in Bahadar, in Gondar, in uh, a big cities. Much of this, uh, there is a high uh, uh, housing problem. So, SAPOs play a vital role, other than other any my financial institution. I can say it. Uh, they also uh, contribute for the reduction of unemployment because they are hiring and they, uh, they, they are hiring uh, different professionals and also they created or they uh, participate in creating decent employment for their members also. The other they extend, they try to provide uh, the financial management of every members, I will, uh, I will say, including me, because I am the member of the SAPO member since uh, 2003. So Morning, still, again, I, I'm going to give you a couple of more minutes because you've also gone over the time and I need to control this a bit. Okay, so please, okay. You've got two more minutes, yeah? Thank you. Yeah. Sorry okay. to interrupt. So uh, they have the, uh, many benefits. Uh, to establish this SACOS, we were uh, passing several uh, steps. Uh, idea, there is idea generation, it is generated by different uh, communities and other participants. Uh, Social economic study we, have, we were undertaking, uh, conduct awareness and sensitization sessions for different targeted groups and starting organizations. We are following such type of uh, procedures, but uh, some of the SAPOs are uh, established without uh, following these steps. But what, what, what I would like to remind is that we need to think of the viability and sustainability of this SAPOs. This is what I want to uh, pass this experience. And the challenges, what well, there are three challenges, what I observed. Actually, there are different, but a key challenge is there is a limitation on professionalization, uh, weak coordination among government organizations, private and others, and also there are two, two numerous and small. So actually uh, the responsible government organization has to coordinate, lead and uh, provide uh, the capacity support. That is a key one and the others can involve based on their capacity levels. Uh, there are some op uh, opportunities for SACO development in Ethiopia. That is one is uh, there is an untouched demand for financial service provisions, and government 
effort also uh, enhances it is sector in capacitating this circles. This is a second opportunity. And that the other is there is better partnership development. That is, any organization wants to uh, work with this circles, uh, be it the primary or the higher level. And there is a positive experience in the community uh, uh, on the impact or importance of the circles. So this is a good opportunity for them. If they leverage from this, they can be a competent financial organization. This is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Wonder Magen. And I would just like to um, move straight on, if I can. And then we will, um, after the next speaker, we'll have a, 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 a opportunity for a discussion and answer some of the questions that are being posed. So please, can I ask um, Ralph Henry to to, to discuss um, the situation in the in the Caribbean? Thank you. It's a great pleasure and honor to have been asked to present a few words uh, this important topic of credit unions in the Caribbean and in Africa. Um, I will try to keep within my 10 minute limit. Um, now, Sadian referred at the very beginning to the differences among countries in terms of membership. And uh, here we see the, some data collected by IMF staffers in respect of 2008, and you see the share of credit union members to total population in um, Caribbean countries. Most of the countries there are Caribbean countries, and you'd see that we have, in the case of Dominica and Montserrat, it's 79.6% um, of the population are members of credit unions. In the case of Montserrat, which is a, a special kind of island in that it has suffered a volcanic eruption and a, a substantial percentage of the population hived off to the UK because they are um, uh, UK citizens indirectly. And uh, it means that the remaining population, you know, 84% are members of credit unions. Um, the IMF staffers, indicated that the credit union membership in the Eastern Caribbean is very high when compared to other countries in the world. And the, 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 these countries are among the 13 economies with the highest ratio of credit union members to total population in a sample of 93 countries. So that's the, the more or less the present situation. Now, while I cannot point to any academic research I have a, a, a sort of working hypothesis that the high membership in credit unions dates back to the rotating savings and credit credit associations. So, sorry, Ralph. Up. Sorry, Ralph. Just a second. We've had a message that people cannot see your screen, so I'm just double checking. Um, can can people see the screen? Is there anybody who cannot see the screen? So thumbs up, meaning people can see the screen. Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, Ralph. Sorry. Okay, that's it. Yes. All right. The Isusu that slaves brought with them, they resuscitated following emancipation. And uh, that was a case of rotating savings and credit informally. And when the British introduced friendly societies um, um, legislation, we saw that large numbers of people graduated to the friendly, establishing friendly societies so that you had a mushrooming of friendly societies in the 19th century with the legislation that was introduced by the British, copying what they had in Britain in the latter part of the 19th century. Fast forward to the 20th century, and we see the legislation being updated for cooperatives and credit unions, and that led to the establishment of a large number of, of, of credit unions, which served low and middle income membership um, in throughout the, the, the latter years of the 20th, the 20th century. 
by and large, the upper class and traditional elite and near white elite in the Caribbean are not generally members of credit unions. They get their services through the, 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 the banking system. And you see in this kind of segmented society that you know, the, where people access credit depends, while the, the low and middle income people do use the, the banks, they rely for, uh, heavily on their own credit institutions, which are the credit unions. Yes, no. Yes. Now, the credit unions in the Caribbean, by and large, are signatories to all the rules that have been elaborated by WACU and, and um, Sarian spoke to this early on. But one of the ratios that the that the WACU insists on is that the loans to assets should be between 70 to 80 percent that 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 credit unions are deemed to be operating fully in keeping with their mandate if they are lending out at, at least 70 percent of their takings um, to the to their members but in most countries of the Caribbean, and we already indicated that there's a high membership of credit unions in, um, in the Caribbean, you find that in most countries, they fail to arrive at a 70 to 80% loan to asset, loans to assets. And it means that there, there, there are some excess funds, or if one might say so, that uh, the savings of low and middle income pe people that are more readily um, available to the high income groups because these funds are put in the banks. And what we find really is that some of the WACU pulls recommendations which people are adopting for their regulatory system um, are pushing credit unions to, uh, to operate as banks with all the rules that apply to banks. And that leads to, for example, in, in the Caribbean and surely in the, my own country, restrictions on the owning of real estate beyond what is necessary for carrying on the operations, restrictions on loans to natural persons only. And that means that they are not normally allowed to lend to SMEs if those SMEs are corporate entities. Um, they are not, a, they are not re readily, the, the funds are not readily available to SMEs. Um, the, the, the rules tend to, how, to, to frown on housing developments and mortgages, etc. And, you know, to the, the frown on credit unions getting into the development of, of, of real estate house for housing, etc. This is a case of, I, I'm just giving you an example of, of, of loans assets. In the case of Barbados, you see that wide disparity between loans to assets in Barbados. Um, in Dominica, again, you see it's, it's all under, under that 70% um, um, target. Um, and this slide, maybe you're not seeing all of it, but unfortunately, the, the slide should also include, I wonder if I can move this a bit. Um, the, the, the data on Trinidad, the, what you have in these slides is the, the assets on the, the left side of the, the country, for the country, and the, the, the loans on the right side, so that you, know, you see assets for Barbados, loans in Barbados, assets in Dominica, loans, and in the case of Trinidad, which, you, which unfortunately you're not seeing, you find Trinidad actually has some of the largest credit unions in the Caribbean um, with, with assets of two to three billion, all right? And the, the two largest credit unions have, have failed to lend out, at least one of them fails to lend out 
in excess of 50% of its loans to assets. So it means that some of, the, some of those funds, a large percentage of those funds would be placed in, in the banking system where they're usually unavailable to the low and middle income for, except maybe for consumer loans. Now, the previous prime minister, Eric Williams in 1970, as a result of the Black Power Revolution, he introduced what he called, uh, the, 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 promoted what he called a, a people's sector in which he envisaged that growth with, they can have growth with equity. He provided a small business window in the Industrial Development Corporation to make loans available to the, the marginalized. And therefore he felt that this could encourage the development of businesses by sm the small people. And he, he reorganized the cooperative legislation to, 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 because he saw cooperatives and in particular credit unions as being uh, achieving that goal of greater equity in the society in these Trinidad and Tobago forces, one of those highly unequal societies in, in so far as the Gini coefficient that you find in the Caribbean and in Trinidad being close to 0.4 and above in terms of, of inequality. The closer the, the, the Gini is to one, the higher inequality. In the Nordic countries, where you have much lower levels of inequality, the, the Gini tends to be under 0.3. In the Caribbean, it's 0.4 and above. And in Trinidad, it's 0.5. This is loans to assets in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago. And you see there again that wide disparity as you look at from 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. In fact, loans to assets actually would be falling in terms of the, 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 that ratio. What we learn from all of this is that the Esusu spirit was incorporated in formal legal structures for friendly societies in the 19th century. And it meant that the friendly societies grew. Um, fast forward to the 20th century, the improvement, the incorporation of legislation for credit unions and cooperatives led to this explosion in the growth of, of credit union members and credit union assets, et cetera. And it means now as we face the demands of the 21st century where, of course, a substantial amount of funds are being mobilized by credit unions. And of course, there's need to ensure financial stability. Um, there's need to incorporate regulations that allow for the demands of the 21st century to be met. And in my own view, this is my own view, the IMF inspired catechism that, and the exercise of discretion, we need to be careful about avoiding and, and avoid IMF inspired catechism and exercise discretion in the use of pearls. Financial stability is an objective that is important but it should not prevent low and middle income groups from being uh, 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 of having funds available for investment and for development finance and for fostering inclusive growth that will engage the middle, low and middle income groups in societies which are highly unequal. Growth with equity must not be abandoned in quest for financial stability. And if we, if we invoke some of the, 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 the goals that are set in the um, SDGs, we see that goal eight and goal 10, which promote greater equity, has to be reflected in any regulatory system, including what we might take on board from PERS, has to be adapted to ensure that we can continue in this process of growth with equity. Um, the UN decade of the people of African descent, and most of us are people of African descent on this, this, um, on this forum, calls for free and meaningful participation by all individuals, including people of African descent, in the development and decision-making related 
uh, there too in the fair distribution of the benefits resulting therefrom. So I think these are the, some of the issues that we have to treat with as we face the present conundrum in the financial services sector, and in particular in looking at credit unions and their role in promoting the development of the little people in these societies, which, as I said, have, have been highly unequal and need to face this issue of growth with equity. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ralph. I think that um, a number of very interesting questions have been raised, and I will now um, see what questions that people might have to put on the on the uh, on the chat um, and see um, to what extent um, they could be answered. Now, some of the in the in the the question and answer session, there are particular questions to different people. I don't know if the speakers have seen um, these uh, questions. And uh, what I'm going to suggest now is that I'm going to read the questions. And even if, even when speakers have um, perhaps tried to um, provide an answer, that uh, we, we um, maybe can discuss them uh, um, as a whole. I'm mindful that we are need, we're, we're going to, um, I want to have about 10 minutes for this session. Um, I'm mindful that we have a speaker or a, a participant from Kenya who is, um, uh, which is, which has got a, the Kenyan credit union system is, is slightly different and perhaps speaks to some of the issues that Ralph has uh, raised. And so, um, but I'm going to, first of all, let's go with the questions that have been asked, and then I will bring in uh, James in, uh, in a moment. So um, the, question, the questions that are still active, so to speak, um, there are two of them from um, Aichu Kebede. There's one, both the, one is to uh, uh, Salian and one is to Raf. And I will just ask uh, the people, I'll read them and then I'll ask, uh, although I'm sure everybody can see. It says um, to Sally, how do, the, how do they address risks of various forms by credit uh, cooperatives? Um, the, 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 ref the reference, unfortunately, I can't see the reference that is being made. Maybe Sally, you saw the reference, but um, it's, I think it's about the regulations. So how do they address risks of various forms by credit cooperatives? Um, any good practice? And whilst Sally is answering that, uh, Ralph, there's a question to you saying, um, restrictions to loans to SMEs, um, how this could tally with addressing unemployment? So if, if, if um, these restrictions were lifted, do you think that the issue of unemployment would be resolved? But first of all, to Sally, uh, Sally Ann, please, um, this question about um, um, how the, I think the various regulations may be necessary to control risk. That's my initial understanding, but maybe that's not a correct understanding of the question. Sally Ann? Well, I think the regulators try to um, look for different things. One of the things is actually to make sure that in the first instance, credit unions have a good regulatory business plan, a plan which actually shows that they are going to be operating in a viable way. And credit unions give um, have to make regular returns to the regulators. They have to provide information which tracks their levels of capital. So for example, in the UK, the capital adequacy requirements for credit unions is quite um, significant, but then they uh, look at um, different types of credit unions. Uh, the capital is linked to the level of risk. So there is kind of risk-based approach to the way in which the capital requirements are set so that it, there will not be too much burden. But really, it's just as um, Ralph has also said, setting these financial indicators which credit unions use to track and monitor their different risks and try to maintain those standards. Capital and liquidity are really important and maintaining a balance between savers and borrowers is actually an important thing which credit unions have to do to continue to remain viable. Okay, um, Ralph? Yes, uh, yes, thanks for that question. No, the, we, we have, an unfortunate structure of 
production and and distribution in 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 our in our countries in that the the elite yes they do in they do invest but they tend to be in businesses that are involved largely in the importation of goods for the domestic economy and not enough involved in the production of goods and services that are geared to export. Now, these countries depend on the earning of foreign exchange because you know, you're small and almost everything that you need, you, lots of what you need, you need to import. But in order to pay for those imports, you, you need to generate exports that are viable. And by and large, they have not invested the, the resources that they have access to in the provision of goods and services for export. So that the, the foreign exchange that is secured in the, in the case of Trinidad from the oil industry, it's, it's really fitted away in the promotion of imports, which can be paid for by the oil revenues, et cetera. And we, what, what a number of us have, have argued is that you really need to create entrepreneurs from the middle and, and lower income, middle, middle and lower income groups who would be more concerned with providing goods and services, less on basis on imports, but more on basis of goods and services that can enter the export market, enter foreign markets. And in that regard, they are more likely to create jobs. But you see in the credit unions that the credit unions are only allowed to lend to natural persons rather than to SMEs that might come from the same membership of, of credit unions. But once they form corporates, they, 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 they can only borrow as individuals, but not as a, as a corporate entity. So there's a sort of restriction there. We see it too in respect of their, their being able to get into the development of housing estates. Now, housing is a, a huge problem, surely in Trinidad and Tobago and, and in many other parts of the country and, and, and many other countries of the Caribbean, where you need to promote um, housing estates to house the population. And those funds that go into the credit unions and that are spare excess could be used to uh, the development of, 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 of housing and housing estates. But there's that, there's that restriction that is imported again from these um, walk, -you, walk you rules because you know, there's the restriction on mortgages, et cetera, which are longer term finance rather than consumer credit. I hope I've answered the question, but you know, the, you can see how all of this can, if, if, if regulations are you know, applied with that level of discretion, understanding that some of these funds have to be used for development purposes, we, we may get wrong the problem of, of inequality, reducing inequality. We get into the issue of reducing inequality and as well address some of the real needs for development of our countries. Okay, thank you, uh, James. At this point, I would like to bring in, sorry, thank you, Ralph. At this point, I'd like to bring in James. James, this uh, question that has been raised around um, the, uh, the difference between the size of loans and, 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 and the size of the assets that uh, credit unions in, um, in particular in the Caribbean uh, have. Um, I'd like you, please, if you would mind, just to, to, to ask, you, is this an issue in Kenya or is it not an issue in Kenya? And how does the Kenyan system um, fare uh, in relation to this particular uh, way of looking at the problem? Um, thank you very much, uh, Adoti, for this opportunity. As I said, my name is James Bowie. I was, I was introduced much earlier. I work for a circle in Kenya, Central Kenya, uh, which is a circle for uh, farmers and, uh, and SMEs. And uh, if I understand the question very well, uh the, the the restriction that we have is that uh, the maximum loan that a member can get in kenya is five percent of the total assets five percent of the total assets of uh, a particular circle uh, however 
if the circle is big enough, because we have some circles that are very, very big, uh, we do not have a lot of limitations as to how much each person can borrow, provided uh, they have the ability to pay and uh, everything else about them has been uh, checked, uh, appraisals and all that, and uh, risk analysis, and they, can, and, and they are able to service the loan. So we don't have um, any other restriction apart from that restriction that have been put there in the law. Oh, okay, all right. And I just want to, while you're here, I just want to also perhaps mention another thing, which is that um, in the Kenyan credit union system, um, uh, people regularly lend to others for business, right? So they lend to, to, to companies for, for business, which does not appear to be the case so much in the Caribbean. So I just wanted to say a little bit about that side of things, because that may point us to understand perhaps what is happening in the Caribbean context in relation to this issue? Um, the issue that uh, has been raised by Dr. Henry from the Caribbean is, is also an issue in the Kenyan uh, circle system. However, uh, the law says that uh, if you have to admit a corporate organization into membership, mm -hmm. you must get a special resolution from the annual general meeting. Uh -huh. uh, however, however, uh, the, the, the biggest challenge that we are facing right now is from the is from the taxman, and the taxman is coming and says you are supposed to be serving individual natural persons. You are not supposed to be uh, serving uh, corporates. If you serve corporates, then you are a union. You are not a private a primary cooperative, and the and the and the unions are are are, are taxed like companies. Where primary cooperatives have um, uh, are, are, have a lot of um, advantages when it comes to the, the tax regime, and so that is a major conversation that is going on now. Taxman is on uh, on the cases of those who are admitted corporates uh, or, or, or corporates, and therefore that is um, a big debate right now and a big issue in Kenya. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So um, even in Kenya, there's a there's a kind of um, a belt or you know a constriction in terms of um, how how much um, uh, credit unions can lend and who they can lend to, and therefore for what purpose. Um, I want to um, what I want to do is to uh, bring this question, bring the discussions around to. A topic, therefore, that I think from the Corporation Africa's point of view, which is very important, I want to try and link up the issue of cooperatives and the issue of this gap between assets and loans. Now, um, Ralph has said, and um, this is a question to everybody, Ralph has said that, you know, he thinks that if lending could be done to the poorer people in the society, um uh that would change the nature that would create more demand for 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 money and that would produce a certain kind of production which would be a bit different from what is going on now so well the question i want to ask you is this that do you see credit do you sorry do you see cooperatives which is um um which is a kind a kind of a grouping which it is known the risk is less lending to cooperatives yes so do you see the point of view, do you see cooperatives as a uh, as a as a way uh, by which this issue can be dealt with i.e if you lend if you if you allow credit unions to lend to businesses and those businesses are cooperatives do you think that will help to solve the gap between assets and loans and do you therefore think that that will help to stimulate growth within the economies uh, our economies whether they're in Africa or the Caribbean this is for this is a general question for everybody I think I can uh, I can try and take that question uh, first. Okay. Uh, it's in Kenya today, and especially the the the, the circle that I that I uh, I manage, it's a circle that was started by coffee farmers, mm -hmm. and uh, these coffee farmers are organized in in through marketing cooperatives, society, marketing societies or cooperatives, if, if you like, and um, and uh, we led. We led to both individual farmers, and we also led to the cooperative societies because the, the, the cooperative societies would be looking for money for working capital, 
because they need the coffee and process many inputs so that they can um, uh, be able to give fertilizers and chemicals uh, for spring and all that to their to their farmers. But uh, this is already become and, and also dairy. Dairy also is big, and with the, uh, and these are people who are also members of uh, the army Kasako. But again, the, the challenge we are having is the taxman. The taxman is telling us you are not supposed to be serving the cooperative societies because the cooperative societies are already corporates in their own right. And therefore, uh, when you serve them and you relate to them, we are supposed to be taxing you like um, a union, which is very punitive uh, as opposed to a, as a being taxed as a primary society. So again, but, but, but uh, leading uh, to cooperative societies, uh, for me, uh, makes uh, things much better because you are able to reach much more members down there. People that we might not be able to reach, the farmers we might not be able to reach, the daily farmers we might not be able to reach, the coffee farmers we might not be able to reach. They are cooperative society because they are with them on the ground, at the grassroots level. They actually can serve them in a much better way. And therefore, if the law can be amended to uh, make it uh, allow circles to lend, these entities i think uh, that would uh, really make things much better and improve uh, the economic um, uh, status of the country and even for those uh, cooperative societies thank you thank very you. much anybody else <coughs> excuse, sorry excuse me i i i, I want i would i want to add a little to, to that and i think what we are facing is looking at the the, the financial infrastructure and looking at the tax system and putting all of this into a development perspective. What do we really want as countries? We want to increase output. We want to in, engage large numbers of people. We want to include in, in particular those who are at the bottom of the society to, to use their resources, limited as they, those might be, in promoting development from below. But if we, if we see it in that larger context, we know that just implementing tax laws you know, willy-nilly just does not contribute to development. And just having rules that says that you, know, that you should not lend to to an uh, entity that is a cooperative, it, it just makes no sense. If indeed in lending to a corp and more so a marketing corp, you can contribute to expansion of output. And at the end of the day, yes, the taxman will come in, but let us make sure that we promote development mm -hmm. and out of the development and you know various cycles, we, 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 we will get the taxes. Indeed. Yes, um, uh, one again. You you wanted to come in. Your your mic needs to be off uh, to be on rather. Please unmute yourself. Okay, uh, I want to say something. Actually, the regulation and the taxation system is different from country to country. For mm -hmm. instance, Ethiopia, uh, the taxation. For instance, cooperatives are exempted from beads, tacos, or other type of cooperatives. The taxation systems uh, exempted income taxes for all cooperatives, be it the primary or the uh, higher level uh, cooperatives, while they are not exempted for other type of cooperatives. Uh, an individual who borrowed from uh, a SACO or any other type of uh, cooperative he may not, he may not exempted, uh, exempted from taxes. He, can, he, he should pay, be it VAT or other kind of taxes, income tax or other uh, sales tax. But uh, in this context, what I understand from the Kenyan, uh, uh, Kenyan person, uh, I, I think the size of the loan and the assets proportion is one is to regulate the liquidity and the other credit risks of the circles to protect this. Uh, as we uh, see the 
previous presenter, the peerless says that protection the P stands for the to protect the credit risk of the SACOs, be it SACO or other a higher level of uh, uh, the, the SACOs. So this is when you see if you uh, beyond 80% of the asset, you, if the SACO lend 80% of the SACO, that means there is in short of uh, liquidity and as a, at the same time, there will be other risks that, that credit default risks may happen and the savers will not be protected. So this is very, very key number. So very key uh, point. So keeping the regulatory aspects and protection or the uh, monitoring tools, introducing and keeping this monitoring tools is very important to minimize the risks also. What I understand from other speakers is, I think uh, from the Caribbean uh, presenter, okay, from the Caribbean presenter, there is a variation of that is a savers and borrowers trade-offs. That is uh, dominancy of the, dominancy of the borrowers or dominance of the savers. I have such kind of uh, point, but what does it mean? Do the SAPOS lend to out of non members? If it is happen, it, there is a dangerous thing that is very, uh, it, it, there is a high risk if they lend out of their members. For instance, in our country, the SACO lend to a horizontally, uh, a horizontal primary cooperative and also a member, not other. Uh, uh, other non-members, it is uh, protected or uh, uh, regulated. Or, I mean, the regulation says to provide for this. If it is happen in other countries, it's very dangerous. This is to share uh, my experience from our countries. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Um, we are going to. It's now. We've, had, we've been running for more than uh, an hour and fifteen minutes, and some of us uh, well. And we need to obey our own rules about how long things last for. So I can see that there's still some questions. Uh, people are actively um, uh, asking questions. I would encourage people to please um, um, either post your questions directly to the to the speaker, or you can finish by putting them on the chat, and we will look at them and try and see if we can get answers for you uh, for those for 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 your questions. Um, uh, I hope that you found this uh, uh, an interesting uh, engagement. We have been asked to look at um, this thing called a credit union and how it works. And um, perhaps we need to ask ourselves, where does it fit into an African development agenda? Yes. Um, and, and, and what changes should Africans make? Yes. In terms of how they are regulated so that it works for African development. I think that becomes the issue. Just because there is something called the, the World Council for Credit Unions and they have their rules is not an, a good enough reason for us just to follow blindly what it is that they, that they, that they, that they want us to do. And um, I just want to give one, one statistic. I looked at the, 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 the amount of the credit unions in, in Africa have and the amount of the credit unions in the Caribbean have, and we have $30 billion sitting down in our assets. And we cannot lend all of this. And we go and look for foreign investors to come and let, to come and invest in our countries when we are sitting on the gold ourselves. Anyway, so uh, I think this is worth us thinking about. Just to say, credit unions are, as uh, Sally said, originated out of Germany. But we know that in an African context, we have something called SUSU, partner, whatever, yes? And so we shall devote a session on looking at that instrument and how it works. Okay, and to what extent it is better and different from the way that credit unions work in the future and going forward in the future. So let me thank very much our four speakers, um, Sally Ann, Ralph, um, James, and Budumagen for, I think, providing a lot, us with a lot of information. Um, we will be able to share that information with those who have registered and attended. And we want to continue these discussions so that um, we can begin to find ways of um, empowering ourselves um, through our own financial initiatives 
um, to deliver and produce um, the wealth that we need to we need to produce. Thank you very much indeed, and have a good Saturday. Have a good weekend. Bye bye.